There's play police, you know, dogs that interrupt um, things at high arousal, and I have footage of that. Um, the play police usually do it without um, hurting or scaring anyone. They usually interrupt by putting their body between two dogs, or they might bark um, and explode between. That was aggression. That's not being the play police. And it was completely unwarranted. There was no high state of arousal. Um, that, that was aggression. And maybe there's a fine line between play police and, uh, and others, but I see a lot of, and I wish I could, I wish I did a whole day of dog to dog stuff and I'd show you all of the footage um, of what the play police look like and why, the, why they're not, a, um, they don't scare dogs at all, at all, usually when they interrupt. The dogs are like, oh darn, but they're not uh, terrified. Um, I want to show you now, I'm going to break down some of these behaviors that I want you to see into very small pieces. Um, and this is a behavior called a pounce off. And these are red flag behaviors, meaning these are not threat displays. These are not dogs who are at threshold. Red flag behaviors, every single dog, great and, and bad, do do red flag behaviors. It's in how, how many they do in a period of time and how many other red flag behaviors they put together that, will, um, that I want you to watch for because it'll increase the dog's, um, he'll, he'll head closer to his aggress aggression threshold. Um, but a red flag behavior is nothing more than a mental post-it. You stick on the back of your head and you go, huh, I want to make sure that I say that I observe the behavior. You don't excuse it away. A red flag behavior in different contexts can mean something completely benign, but in other contexts it can mean the dog's arousal level is up or he's thinking a little bit bad thoughts, but he's not threat displaying. But I always observe them and I will not excuse them away. I might observe them and then make an excuse for them, um, but that's a different story. So a pounce off is like a swimmer's turn off of a human. It's front feet push in and change direction. Those were two of them. I'll show you in slow motion right there. And that is, it's a, again, that's not a, um, it's not aggression, but it's, it says to me, huh, the dog is using me. <laughs> and he's also with his front feet, it's uh, very pushing and it'll expel air. And it's, um, Again, it's a young puppy. This doesn't frighten me in any way, but pounce off. Pounce off. And this is, um, was one of our most highly, adopted, highly adoptable dogs. Lovely dog and placed with the people that make our sweatshirts and t-shirts. You know, years and years later, fantastic dog. That was a pounce off. And she was in a high state of arousal when she first came out of her kennel. And that was the one and only pounce off she did. She had, in her two whole minutes of the sociability test, two red flag behaviors. That was one of them. And um, so again, not in any accumulation, but was that a pounce off by my definition? Front, front feet, one or two at the person, and the change of direction. Yes. So these are red flag behaviors. And here it is in slow motion. Jump up, push off. Very gentle compared to the um, other. This is a much more aggressive. They're red flag behaviors. Um, it's, a, it's a heightened state of arousal, but it's also um, a frustration, and it's directed at you. And so I think that puts you at slightly higher risk than a dog who is not turning around to say, stop doing this, or stop holding me back, or I want to leave, or... I mean, it's what's often taught in search and rescue as the uh, indication for a find. Like a dog will pounce off and then run and, you know, run to the the baby boy in the woods. Um, I'm not saying it's a red flag behavior there, but it's, it's a way, really a way to get an owner's attention. Do you see how that was more of a, a two foot slap? But it is a pounce off, much more aggressive. This dog is in a very high state of arousal. And let me show you another uh, and maybe you'll recognize this dog. Stroke number one, pounce off. See, 
See how high he came up? And um, looks right at the tester's face. And then he changes direction. Second one, same, uh, same dog, different uh, pounce off. And one of the other behaviors I want you to be able to observe, I call it a jump clasp. And it's a high arousal, red flag indicator. It's often pre-mounting. And um, mounting is sometimes sexual, and sometimes you know, dominance, status seeking, sometimes conflict. Um, most of the time, uh, a, um, a soup of all the above you know, said uh, reasons. But um, you'll see when the dog jumps up and makes contact, the wrists are bent. And uh, it's jump clasp, high state of arousal there. Even small dogs can do it. It doesn't tend to knock you off your feet. It tends not to be painful. It's usually not in your stomach. But it's a pounce off. That's a patty cake. And then this is a pounce off. All right. So that's a behavior I want you to um, have in your repertoire of being able to notice. Yes, question. Yes, you often do see a muzzle punch. And a uh, muzzle punch is a, is a closed mouth, nose. Um, and it's, it can, I think a muzzle punch can be anywhere from what I call a nose bop, with a gentle push of the nose, to a sort of a spear, a, a, a real pop. Um, I had a client uh, in New York City when I was doing dog training. They had adopted a um, medium-sized mixed-breed male dog. Uh, who had been at a, a no-kill shelter there for years. And the volunteer who had been walking the dog finally decided to take him home. And there was, of course, a reason why nobody had adopted the dog or he had been adopted and returned, in that he was, had very low thresholds for aggression. He was a real problem. And um, he was fine with the male volunteer that had walked him for years. Um, and they established a relationship in, in the apartment and in the city where he was very manageable. But then he had a girlfriend move in and the dog was not um, good with her. And so that's when they called me in and I gave them, you know, things to do, um, situations to avoid, you know, like keeping him off the furniture because if he was up there he's particularly bad and all these things and he was very manageable for them for quite a long time. And then um, they called because he had cut his pad really badly on a piece of glass in New York City and it had like four layers of stitches, very deep bandaging and then they had to cover the bandage with a plastic bag every time they took him for a walk. And they um, relaxed on all of their other um, management protocols because they felt sorry for the dog and because he was injured. And, and so the, um, the girlfriend, maybe the wife at this point, had um, the dog, I think it was up on the bed and she was changing the bandage or he was on the floor. I don't remember exactly where it was. He went at her muzzle punched. He never opened his mouth. And he hit her so hard in the forehead, he knocked her out. That's aggression. That is really serious aggression. It's just not going to have teeth. Um, but that is really hard. Um, so I have no idea what question somebody asked, or if that even addressed it, or whether clearly I just needed to tell that story. <laughs> I don't remember. Um, these are behaviors I associate with um, territorial marking or resource marking, guarding, claiming of property and things. And um, there's a cluster of behaviors that go together um, that I see really often. And they're sometimes all together in conjunction. It's the same, it's based on the same string of, of um, movement in the dog. And um, the behaviors are a shoulder swipe. And it's, um, cats do this all the time. It's known, it's known as scent marking in cats. And they'll start, they have scent glands here. They start with their chin and they'll rub. Um, they'll do it to furniture and they'll do it to people and, and whatever. And it's known as scent marking in the feline group. Um, and um, it's the same motor pattern. Dogs, as far as we know, don't have scent here, and they don't use their chin. They'll always start at the back of their neck. And there's always a, a, 
anywhere from the base of the uh, top of the neck and down to behind the shoulder blade and they'll rub and face away from the, the person. They'll do it to furniture in the room. Um, they also do what I call an anal swipe and uh, it's an embarrassing term and it starts with A so it's often at the start of the alphabet and the start of all my files and so I have to explain away anal swiping before I even get my name out and that, that can be bad. Um, the file's called anal swipe and I'm trying to introduce myself. But uh, the tail is kept high and therefore when the dog moves around um, he'll brush his anus against you or furniture and um, sometimes as a duration event they will move their tail high and sit on your foot and you can feel their anus on the top of your shoe or on your lap as the case may be. Um, we know that at four and eight o'clock on the dog's um, anus or the, the anal glands, the heaviest scent glands that they have used for marking. We know that when they poop they release a little. Um, no one has proven that um, the anal swipes that I see are scent marking. I believe they are. Um, and then also the, uh, uh, two more behaviors in this cluster is a, what I call a shoulder stance and that is, often starts with a shoulder swipe on the person but then the dog will um, settle his feet, he'll stop moving and, and raise his head up and stay there and then it's a duration event and the dog is almost always either obliquely front end of their body blocking um, the tester um, or in front of you. They're almost never completely in front of you, although, but that happens. And I call it a shoulder stance. And it's absolutely a, um, it's controlling access to a resource, namely you. If I just meet a dog and I don't know him, I have no relationship with him, and he shoulder swipes me, shoulder stances me, uh, anal swipes me, or sits on my, some part of me with his anus, I mark it as a slight red flag behavior when I do shelter dogs. And, um, and the reason is, in the absence of social interaction, the dog has, who does it shows no sociability toward me, and he starts to shoulder swipe me or anal swipe me, I believe um, in that relationship, dog to me, He's treating me not with love, respect, admiration, or shared joy, or, or anything else you would interpret as part of a good relationship. I think he's treating me primarily as property to be marked. And in that situation, again, there's, we have no bond. He's not shown me any sociability, and he starts doing that. I feel like he's claiming me as property. And just as when there's a human and human, two, part, two people in partnership, in that relationship, when one of the um, partners considers the other one primarily as property, um, and, and not the relationship isn't based mostly on shared joy, love, experience, respect, I think the person being treated as property is at great risk of neglect and physical violence. I think when a human treats a dog primarily as property, puts them out in the backyard, chains them up, doesn't bring them in, they don't sleep in at night, or the relationship is one where it's, I own the dog, it's not shared joy, it's respect. I think that dog is, I don't think, I know that dog is at greatest risk of neglect and physical violence from the part of the owner. And the same holds true when the dog primarily treats the human as property in the absence of a relationship. So I think these things are red flag behaviors for me. I do not think when your dog shows you this at home or all over your house or your friends, that this is a red flag behavior. I think in the absence of actual an aggression, we do want a dog that would stand between us and some, some threat. We don't want him to growl or you know, give us a lawsuit or bite, but um, I like to know that my dogs would like to protect me even just to block access. Again, now I'm not talking aggression. I can't have a dog that wants to bite, but um, when my dog hops Singh just repositions himself in front of me when some stranger comes by I'm like Thank, thanks hop actually I call him Papa thanks Papa um, so I think as part of a, a normal relationship I also think if you have more than one dog at home which most people do nowadays you'll see almost all a lot of these behaviors um, 
especially in the communication between dogs in your household, they're always trying to decide who's got access to you, the greatest resource of all, and they'll be shoulder swiping you and the other dog and cutting between. So this is a, a rich environment for you to do a field study at home. Do you understand, I don't consider these red flag behaviors in your dogs at home. It's not like you should go home and worry. Um, here's what they look like, and once again, these the behaviors, the shoulder swipe, often, if the dog continues, often turns into a, um, an anal swipe. And um, it's an English setter just meeting me. There's a shoulder swipe, an anal swipe, another shoulder swipe, and an anal swipe, and an anal plant, and an anal swipe on the chair. That's his greeting. And so I feel like saying, hello, my name is Sue. And he says, uh, I'm going to sign my name all over you. And uh, you should just be clear here that it's my chair, you're, that's my pants, uh, you know. I don't know why they're doing it. But um, again, so, and again, he's not about to bite me. He's not at threshold. But I say to myself, well, these are sort of a lot of red flag behaviors. It's not a friendly greeting. He considers me property for whatever reason. And, um, and there's the anal swipe. And I swear, if you could um, look at a scent anal glands under and it uh, fluoresced under a black light, I swear, if you turned off the lights after I'd been with this dog, his name, his signature graffiti would be all over me and the room. And there'd be no doubt who owned the room and who was there. If you went in with a black light, his anus is all over me. This is a pointer mix, shoulder, anus, shoulder, shoulder rub. Now, I used to say that I thought these were scent marking behaviors, and, um, and I would like to prove it, and I still would like to set up an experiment and gather data. However, I'm really confident saying they're scent marking behaviors, and here's the reason. I noticed that dog professionals, if I had a male dog up here, sometimes even a female, and I'm standing here, and she start, he starts sniffing my leg. At some point, all of you dog people would say, Sue, Sue, he's about to lift his leg on, your, on you. And I would pull him away and thwart the urine. If you never owned a dog, or you only owned um, a pet dog and he'd never lifted his leg on you, I would stand here, you would watch, the dog would sniff, and then he would lift his leg and urinate all over me before any of us would notice that he was about to do it. And so I say to myself, because I've always noticed that dog professionals can predict when a dog's about to lift his leg, and it's not just sniffing. We start looking when they start sniffing a vertical surface because we're worried that they'll mark. But I said to myself, if everyone who works with dogs can anticipate it, there's got to be a clear behavior that the dog does that makes us all go, oh, oh he's about to pee. So I took all my footage of that, and I started watching it. And as it turns out, so let's say here's the male dog, and here he is, sniff, 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 sniff. It's the movement that makes people go, oh, he's about to lift his leg, is exactly the movement that precedes a shoulder swipe. And we know that leg lifting is a form of territorial or scent marking, claiming resource if you consider territory as a resource, and I do. Um, so I'm really confident making my interpretation that these are resource, um, resource guarding type behaviors. And uh, it's really interesting because, um, so these are behaviors that I've seen and I share all over the world and once you've seen it then you'll start staring at dogs' anuses first and it's embarrassing and, and I'll change you for the worse because that's all you're looking at and now. Um, and it's gotten me in, you know, in trouble, um, misinterpreted on the internet as me being perverse or something's wrong with me, whatever. Um, I think these are important behaviors to observe. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, um, no, totally forgot. You have a question? Why do I consider it a red flag? Okay, because here's... Um, I'll repeat the question. She said, if he's not going to bite and he isn't about to bite, why do I consider this a red flag behavior? And to me, I, when I'm with a dog, any dog, 
I want to know if this is a threshold. And I don't know where his threshold is, right? I don't know what will send him closer to the threshold. But I do know that when they get there, there are behaviors that will warn you. And one of the first things to observe is a lack of um, sociability, actual social contact um, with you. These are when you're meeting dogs, not, not your own. Um, and I look at this and I say to myself, where is this dog going if that's threshold? When I notice red flag behaviors, such as the dog is marking me, um, and, I, and I'm using that term, um, again, and he's shown me no sociability, I think um, if he did become aggressive, he was likely to use less inhibition in his bite, because I think one of the things that stops a dog from hospitalizing you or uh, people is a bond and sociability. And um, there are a couple of, of um, studies on temperament testing. Um, the largest published study is on a Cessapet, and uh, Kelly Bolin did over 2,000 dogs. And she found a correlation between lack of sociability and um, aggression. Amy Martyr, Dr. Amy Martyr is a veterinary behaviorist out of Boston, and I don't know if she published her study, and it was a smaller number, but she found a correlation that the dogs who were more sociable were less likely to be aggressive in life and in, in general. So sociability is a big component, but um, what I need to do, I can't just say to myself, well, I'm only going to care about behaviors that are at threshold, like the freeze or the snarl. It's too late. So I say to myself, I want to know where the dog, when he's heading there, or signs that um, if he's going to be aggressive, it could be serious. And so those, to me, are red flag behaviors. If a dog shows one or two or three little red flag behaviors and they disappear, or most of the interaction seems he's healthy and relaxed or he's being sociable or whatever, I don't let them worry me. But I have to notice each and every one in order to notice how many occur. Does that kind of answer your question? Uh, um, yeah. Um, I consider these dogs, and I don't have the proof yet, but I consider um, dogs who uh, test like this, who, who show a lot of these behaviors, as um, being at higher risk for resource guarding food and toys. I don't have that um, proven. There she's sitting with her anus on my shoe, which you can't tell unless you ask me. Um, and she's doing all sorts of shoulder swiping. And there she missed my shoe. And again, doesn't she look like she's about to lift her leg? Right? But she doesn't. She shoulder rubs me. Shoulder. She moves her tail away, and you'll, if, you, if it were your shoe, you'd feel her hot little round anus planted right on your shoelaces. And you would, like I often feel, you'd feel like going home and laundering your sneakers, as well as all the rest of your clothes. And again, this dog's not at threshold. But she showed me no sociability, and she started marking me all over. And again, I feel like she's treating me as property. That's not, um, there's no deference or respect in that introduction and it worries me. Oh. And this is a Catahoula at a shelter in uh, down south. Shoulder. And again, it was preceded by the sniffing that looks uh, like she's about to have an mark. There's a lot of shoulder rubbing here, rather forceful. Anyway, um, the other behavior that's really important uh, I want you to notice is called a shoulder stance. And again, I describe that. Um, you see this uh, really often. And they are anywhere from the base of the dog's, uh, uh, the back of the dog's um, head, the top of his neck, down to the start of his loin, either touching or um, within an inch of touching the tester. And again, usually the front end is in a blocking position. Head, head is high, and they wait there. And the reason why I want you to notice that is, if you're a stranger trying to approach the owner here, this dog is saying, I have a potential to bite you. I am guarding my owner. I'm controlling access to my owner. 
And um, if I were an owner and my dog did that, and you were a threat, maybe I'd be happy. But 99,000 people that approach you in your lifetime are not going to be a threat. They're actually going to be friendly or benign. And uh, um, and I also think if you have a resource garter and part of the motivation to bite strangers or to go after strangers is guarding you as a resource among other fear or whatever else is, are the components of the motivation, I think seeing that your dog does that and repositioning him out of a guarding stance can lower his threshold. I don't know that for sure. Um, that's my, my feeling. I would certainly change my own dog's um, um, I want to control my dog's, the access for the stranger to my dog. So if anyone's going to be in a shoulder stance, it would be me to the dog, which is also um, better management. And that's defined as a shoulder stance. And again, really important, I want you to see these, um, see these behaviors. I'll show you uh, another, and then I'll put it in context for you. Here's our, oops, our English setter again, our shoulder swiping, anal swiping English setter, and there's a, st a shoulder stance. And again, I think if you approached me then, I think you're at greater risk. These are behaviors I really want you to notice. He's also staring up at my face. Now, let me put it into context a little bit. This was a two-year-old um, intact male yellow Labrador retriever at a shelter in Virginia. And uh, we had, uh, at, this was at the very end of his um, assessment. And he had tested out, not dangerous at all. Um, he didn't fail any portion of his test, but he had no sociability. Um, which puts him in a gray area category for us in terms of placement, just that um, all of our uh, experience shows that the less sociability, um, the, first of all, the longer the length of stay the dog will have in the kennels, which is not good for their behavior or their mental state. Um, they're at higher risk of return, and they're at much higher risk of problem behaviors severe problem behaviors. So they won't just chew up a shoe, they would decimate a house. They don't just um, bark a little bit for two minutes when you leave them. They bark continuously and the neighbors complain or you get evicted. So they're, uh, they're at risk of much more severe behavior problems. Um, however, the dog also was not disinterested in humans. He just didn't want to um, socialize or be affectionate he wanted to do something with you. So he was completely attentive. He had an incredibly high and appropriate toy drive. The dog tested out like an amazing working dog. And the suggestion for this shelter was find him a call customs, call um, you know, drug enforcement or arson. This should be a working dog. Like I think he would be somebody's dream working dog. Very confident, really clean and honest um, head and brain, um, and a very high working drive. Um, Anyway, uh, this was the end of his test, and we use a baby doll and then a toddler doll to test what their responses are to infants and to toddlers. And without having the time to explain it to you, I know you're thinking, a doll? Give me a break. Dogs with their sense of smell, of course they know it's not real. That's insane. How can you judge a dog based on a doll? And in a nutshell, all I'll say is, if you can find me real children to use to test dogs, I'll use them. <laughs> I think the most important thing we can find out about a dog before putting him in our community is how he is with children and infants. Not every dog left alone with a baby kills it, all right? We like to think that it's just the irresponsible mother or father who left the kid alone with the family dog and turned their back and all of a sudden, you know, that's all it took. You just turn your back and the dog kills the infant. Most dogs don't kill infants. I'm telling you, parents leave their kids unattended with dogs every day, all the time. Right now, it's happening somewhere in America. Um, it takes a different type of dog to want to kill an infant. It's, um, I think it's triggered into a, a, a predatory attack. Um, and on another day, I could show you footage of the dogs, do, uh, dogs doing it to dolls, and I'll show you why it's so predatory. 
Um, but anyway, um, there's, here it is, baby doll test. And I want to show you, again, it's at the very end of the assessment. I've spent 15 minutes with the dog, and I played with them. So I bring out the baby doll, and it's making baby noises. Wah, wah, ee, 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 whatever babies make. It's, you turn on a little button in the back. And I looked at the dog's state of arousal, and I was like, oh boy, he, he's going to be so aroused, he's like his toy test. He's going to want to play with this thing. That's what I'm already expecting, right? And I hold the, the, the doll away from the dog, just like a mother would. You would pull the feet away. And then um, I want you to watch his uh, expression. First of all, on his own, he comes down off of his arousal, all right? And the second thing is, most of the time when he interacted with me, and again, he never softened or came over and nuzzled or gave his paw or wanted any kind of uh, physical contact with me. His ears were with me always forward, his eyes always open, mostly aligned, and his tail was almost always high, which is less uh, friendly, it's less soft. Um, and he, again, never was attracted to uh, me in that way. Watch what happens after I bring the baby down. Where are his ears now? They're forward, his brow is tense, He's in a high state of arousal. He's aligned and frontal, his spine, his head, and his ears. And I will turn the baby around to face him. And first thing that happens, his ears go back, his forehead relaxes. He is doing the equivalent of a smile. In other words, his eyes will soften. He um, bends his spine. He comes off alignment. He lowers his tail. He wiggles his body. I was like, well, I should place you on the planet of infants because you love them. But then watch, so he does a lovely greeting of the child, and then watch what he does. He, take, he took up a guarding stance. And let me tell you, like, I know it's a doll, right? And I'm doing that, and when he did that, it brought a tear to my eye, and I swear I felt like petting him and going, thank you, Lassie. It felt like, <laughs> here was the dog gonna protect the family. It felt so bizarre, but... Um, Anyway, I don't think this is inappropriate at all, especially his, um, I, I don't know, to me, you know, he's not growling, he had no aggression. Um, this was guarding, but again, the, um, the, uh, the context is important. Um, red flag behaviors, anal swiping, shoulder swiping, these behaviors. The other reason, they can look really random or accidental, especially the anal swiping. It's like, oh, how could the dog have known what he was doing or whatever. And I, when I first started noticing all these behaviors, I thought they were rather random or incidental, like, oh, they just happen through time and space. But when I went and I looked at hundreds of hours of footage, the dogs with, who score almost zero sociability Zero to four is really low sociability. Were the dogs most likely to show all the um, marking behaviors? The dogs with the highest sociability were the least likely to show the behaviors. If they were accidental, the distribution among social and non-social dogs would be random. It is so not random. And I've got actually 140-something dogs that have been tested, coded, counted. I took five red flag behaviors and sociability, um, those shoulders and the anus behaviors. I uh, trained uh, a colleague to be 85% reliable at doing the exact same coding, and uh, the data is with a grad student of Ray Coppinger's, and um, hopefully it'll be published, but to, it shows that. The other reason why I think these are red flag behaviors is they occur most often in dogs with no social attraction to humans, or very little. And uh, we know that that is, lowers the threshold. Um, okay, let me give you a few, a few more of these. And then, so what does social, actual social contact look like? How can you say a dog is actually being sociable or friendly? I know you know it in your heart. I know you can recognize it in a dog. A helicopter tail, right? The tail that goes in circular motion. But have you met friendly dogs who don't have a helicopter tail? Yes, me too. How else might you try and describe? So she says, look at the face a lot, and the smaller eyes and the ears back. I would totally agree with you, except, man, that's hard to teach people. The whole eye thing, because it's like, um, if you want to see that you, the dog is nice because you don't want him euthanized, you will not see smaller or bigger eyes. 
you'll just see what you want to see. So it has to be sort of really measurable. And ears back, some dogs will pin their ears right before they bite you. And some dogs in fear will have their ears back. But um, they'll also, like here's how a dog looks when he smiles. So here his ears are forward, and his, you know, his, his brow is furrowed, and his eyes are open, he's alert and aroused. And then he sees his owner, and he wags, and he looks around. So his eyes will squint and his ears will go back at that moment. His forehead, will, the muscles will relax. I think if we had ears, if you smile, your ears move too. And if we had more expressive ears like a dog, our, um, I think our ears would go back as well. Our forehead relaxes. I think it's all the same muscles. Um, as it turns out, you can kind of count. Um, when I do assessments, I needed a way to count sociability so it could be coded and quantified, and so it could take the, the subjectivity out of it. And the definition that I found that works, I would say 95% of the time, to describe an actually friendly dog, um, that almost always includes, because would you agree some dogs are friendly but their eyes aren't soft? Yeah, me too. Uh, would you agree that some dogs who are being friendly, their ears are up or down or in both? And so I don't, I don't want to have a description of friendliness that would exclude a, bun a bunch of friendly dogs because they don't meet the criteria. So your description of friendliness, especially when assessing dogs, has to include the majority of dogs that are being friendly. Or, um, so it's got to work on 95% of the dogs. And so I came up with a definition that has worked. It's not perfect, but it works 95% of the time. And that is two seconds or longer of physical contact the dog orienting toward the tester. The exclusions are mounting, biting. And biting, I call, um, biting to me is any mouth or teeth on you, even if it's non-hospitalizing. So I don't call it mouthing, I call it biting. It doesn't make me, you know, kill the dog, but I just call it biting. It's fine with me. Biting is mouth on somebody. Um, so the exclusions are mounting, biting, and sniffing. If he's sniffing you more than two seconds, I don't think that's um, sociable. I won't count it. And again, the dog has to orient to you. He can't jam his a-hole at you. Um, that's not how we would greet anyone either. And so if you did that in social contact, um, you won't know if it lasts two seconds or longer unless you start counting every time the dog meets the criteria. Here is a pointer um, at a shelter, and she's going to, with her muzzle, make contact. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi, seven Mississippi, eight Mississippi, Mississippi, ten Mississippi, eleven Mississippi, twelve Mississippi. So for every two-second block, I give her one point. So she would have had six points. That was 12 seconds, 12 full seconds. And, um, and she did it by sustaining the physical contact with her muzzle, as, as the case may be for this dog. I did this workshop a long time ago in Japan, and uh, some polite member of the audience raised her hand afterwards, and she goes, excuse me, what is Mississippi? <laughs> I thought that was funny. Um, here is... Remember the dog that uh, I said did the pounce off? It was her uh, one of two red flag behaviors. And here she is, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four, and on and on and on. And what you see, I think she has a very soft eye from what you can see, her ears are back, her forehead's relaxed. She's never looking at the plane of the tester at the face with all alignment. She's confident, but um, her eyes, her head, or her spine are always off alignment which is another way to be friendly. Same dog, a little bit different. And again, um, little smiley lip circumstances, um, ears back, forehead relaxed, very uh, frequent blinking, way more than once every two seconds, generally slow blinking, and the contact is just sustained. And very respectful of space. You don't see the person trying to get out of the way. So that's a definition of sociability, if you like. Um, And so uh, if you had to count, here's a Pitbull Sharpe mix. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, sniffing, so I stop. 
one Mississippi, I stop, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three mi sniffing, I stop, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, <gasps> Sippy, five Mississippi, six Mississippi, seven Mississippi, eight, on and on and on. So the a dog is orienting to the tester with this part of her body counts. She can face away. Um, and that's a highly social dog. Highly social. Highly social. So that's... Um, but that's very hard to teach people um, soft eye and things like that. All right. Um, let me uh, hang on. A couple of other of these behaviors. Then we're going to break for lunch. We're going to eat so we can no longer eat. And then uh, we're going to start after lunch. I'm just going to start bringing dogs in. And what I'd like to do is um, do some sociability testing with you. Uh, and the dog, so I'll do the 60 seconds. We'll just observe the dog at first. I want you to just say the behaviors you see. Because I know it's like easier for you to look at video footage because you're not emotionally connected to those dogs. But I'm going to bring out a real dog. And what's going to happen is there's a part of your brain near the hippocampus and the hypothalamus and the lizard part. It's called the excuse center. And it will light up. And you will start making an excuse for the dog. And um, all I'll tell you is that, as far as I can tell, every human has an excuse portion of their brain, and you never get rid of it. I've had it since I started working in shelters in 1981, and it lights up all the time. What I've done is I realize a couple things. When I want to make an excuse for a dog, like, oh, maybe he just shoulder rubbed because he's itchy, or maybe he sat on my shoe planting his anus there because his, um, he can't lower his tail, or whatever. Anytime I make an excuse, I am aware that I'm making an excuse, and I say to myself, the reason I'm making an excuse is I see the red flag behavior. In other words, if I didn't see a little issue in the dog that I needed to remember, I wouldn't make an excuse. I have never yet met somebody who looked at a dog being friendly and social and made an excuse and said, maybe he's just being friendly because, you know, he's a simpering golden retriever mix. No one tries to make an excuse when they're seeing behaviors that they like or that they think aren't critical of the dog. We make excuses for dogs, particularly in the shelter world, because we're worried about the destiny of the dog. We're worried about what we might observe that might get that dog euthanized. And it colors, as it should, color what we uh, see or, or think, what we think. It shouldn't, it shouldn't um, hide what we see. And the more we can just acknowledge seeing, which is why it's important to see all the red flag behaviors, because they'll, they'll never get a dog killed. But we can, we can see them. Um, and we have to be able to note them and observe them. It's the only way to stay safe, and it's the only way to make better, um, better predictions and better placements for the dogs in our own communities. So anyway, um, I don't remember why I started that whole thing either, um, except to say we're going to do real dogs. And then also in the after well, I'd like to start the afternoon just looking at um, um, the behaviors the, and look at thresholds and where the dog is likely to have a problem or not. Um, and depending on the behaviors of the dogs, I may or may, immediate, I may, or may not immediately get into defensive handling or even handling techniques. I'll probably start out with that. But I will do dogs right after lunch because that's when you're most likely to take a nap. And that's always embarrassing. Um, one of the behaviors that um, in the first, uh, the first time I had a, a student want to do a, a, an official scientific study of part of my assessment many, many years ago, um, as a biology student in um, college, and uh, he and his professor looked at just the sociability test. And they asked me to come up with a definition, a codable, countable definition of sociability for the student, and also to choose five red flag behaviors that he would then code. And they would compare them and look at the four different tests and whatever. And of the five behaviors I used, of course, shoulders and anus um, and I don't remember a, a, another one, but the, most, the one that correlated the most with lack of sociability or uh, outcome. In other words, we didn't, do, um, we didn't track all the dogs for what happened to them, 
but in the informal tracking of what happened with some of the dogs and how the rest of their testing went, the behavior that was most indicative of a problem dog was a lunge away. And um, a lunge away is defined as, it can only happen on leash, so it doesn't happen all the time. It is not a dog who pulls on leash or doesn't walk well on leash. Um, it is a specific behavior where the dog pulls as hard as he can away from the tester, away from you, so hard that his, um, his head will come down as, his weight, uh, as he puts his weight into it, and the weight will come off of his front end. And sometimes he'll actually have no feet on the ground, but very often they do it and their feet are on the ground. That's a lunge away. And in slow motion, so this isn't, it's not, it's preparing for, and the head comes down and the weight comes off. That's a lunge away. And these were significant, significantly correlated with lack of sociability. And the reason why I think these are red flag behaviors, a uh, lunge away is, I think the dog is putting 100% of his strength into pulling away from you. And what worries me is, if he gets aggressive, I think these dogs would put 100% of their energy and muscle into aggression towards you. That's why I think it's sort of dangerous. I think it's an indicator of how bad the dog might get. I also think there's a very significant correlation between a dog that pulls so hard on leash, it's hard to remain upright, and dogs with um, serious problem behaviors. And there's another lunge away, same dog, and a shake off, a lunge away, airborne lunge away. Are you also all staring at her anus? Are you still doing that or are you looking for the lunge away? People usually stare at anuses. Head down, lunge away. Her, and she does uh, her front feet off the, ga the ground. Shake off. Lunge away. Um, I'll show you a couple more uh, lunge aways. the shake off and she asked what are they kind of telling us with that I think thank you I think a shake off after contact is a red flag behavior it is also um, well usually it usually it occurs um, when it when it occurs after contact I consider a tiny red flag behavior um, You'll see shake-offs when your dog comes in from the rain, after he comes out from under the covers in the morning, and he has to put his hair back. Um, if you, you, know, you have a Lhasa Apso, and he's got that neat part down the center, and you take one part of a lock of hair, and you, you know, move it to the side, he'll shake it off and fix it. Um, that's all fine. I don't, I don't care about those behaviors. But when it occurs after contact, I feel like it's a tiny red flag behavior. My interpretation, the total interpretation is that the dog is taking off your cooties, that you were disgusting to him for a second. So, I don't know. Um, uh, just quickly, um, uh, I want to show you some of the footage of jump clasp, which is what I told you, look for the, um, the wrist to be bent. And in slow motion, this will look, or should look to you like mounting. Same dog, oh, same thing. So anyway, uh, jump class and the, the part of the dog's body during the contact is um, the wrists are bent. And it's usually an indication of high arousal um, and or a pre-mounting behavior. Do you see the wrists bent there? And the interesting thing is she urine marked and then did this to the tester. Um, so I don't think there's, uh, there was anything sociable about what she was doing. Okay, now, this is not a red flag behavior. This is a, a, a threshold, 
a threat display. This dog is at threshold. It's a beautiful warning because um, it tells you the dog's communicating and it's not just going to bite you. And if you do what the dog wants, you won't get bitten. It's not about winning or losing. And this is, um, again, not a red flag behavior. This is a uh, threat display. It's the very first one that usually occurs. And it's a freeze. And I have two definitions of freeze. One, it's a cessation of movement, not necessarily all movement. I don't have a time frame for you. I have one category which I call possible freeze. And here's how they occur. This is what would happen in your head. You'd be watching a dog and you'd go, was that a freeze? I'm not sure. Did that dog just freeze? And you're not sure you'd like to backpedal. You're not, you know, by what the dog did afterwards, you're not sure. So I just say that's a possible freeze. I don't consider that a threat display, but a possible threat display. And then there's a freeze where, believe me, you see it and you'll go, you'll make the, the sound that audiences make. They make two sounds. One is, ah, and the other sound is, <gasps> ooh. And when you see a freeze, um, you make the uh, other sound. That was a freeze. Did you see it? So he's scratching, and I say, here, buddy, let me help you scratch. And there he stops moving. And he's saying, he cursing, I never curse, but he goes, take your bloody hands off of me. And I say, OK, and he says, good. Now I can go back to scratching. And he says, get your bloody hand off my head. And I say, OK. He says, good, thank you touch the top of my head again, he says, and I might bite you. Ma'am, he says, I thought I told you. <laughs> and uh, incidentally, he's at the same time anal marking. And so this dog hits threshold with pleasurable petting. And if you have a dog that hits a threshold when you're just petting him in, in what would be like a, just a, um, a pleasant way, that's a dog with low thresholds. Most dogs don't hit a threshold till you make them do something they don't want to do or something sort of extreme or two things need to come together, like he's afraid of vacuum cleaners and people in uniform. And I did a consult once with a Bernice Mountain dog that had um, hospitalized, in fact, the maid that he had hospitalized was still in the hospital a week later. And his, he's always been aggressive with strangers, and so partic particularly people in uniform, and he's also terrified of the vacuum. And lo and behold, on this day, the maid's bra the vacuum, he's good with the maid, her vacuum cleaner broke, so she called her friend who works at the other, you know, the maid service, can you bring over your vacuum cleaner? So the stranger arrives in a uniform with a vacuum cleaner, and the dog said, that's my threshold, and he bit her in the groin um, so badly that she was in the hospital. Um, so. so things come together. But this dog has very low thresholds. Um, freeze, let me show you a couple more. Now, I'm going to show you this footage will take, um, I know I'm, I'm going to show this as the last one. Well, hang on. This is a, a classic freeze. Ignore the chow's uh, blue eye. It's not natural. Uh, but it's not the reason she's freezing. Ooh, right? There's the sound. And she flared her nostrils like my sister did. And um, she also muscled up. Do you see how she took more space and air? So that's, uh, that's a very definite freeze. And she doesn't diffuse, right? She didn't come down or give space when I stopped. Um, actually, it wasn't me, but when the tester stopped. But I want you to tell me when, oops, sorry. Ah. Okay, little Mac. I'm going to have to put this Mac on its back during the break, get it to listen to me. Um, this is another baby doll test, and this is a, a blue and white little female pit. And um, you tell me when the dog freezes.
Ooh, did you hear you guys say it? And, uh, and no matter where I go, I show that and everyone knows the moment. And um, here it is in slow motion. Direct eye contact with the baby. Into her space. And there's the phrase. And sustained eye contact. And it scares people. It scared me too. Yeah. Is there a correlation between that and the sounds the baby is making? I've tested dogs um, when shelters have dolls that don't make sounds, and I've seen um, the same type of reactions. Um, I think sounds help because it helps orient the dog to the item, which you're trying to test the dog and find out the most information in the shortest period of time. Um, I also think sound often can trigger a dog into predatory behaviors, which is what we're looking for very often in testing for infants. So um, I'm giving you an hour to eat, and if you all look at the clock in the back, it's eight. I don't hear the dog. Oh, he's there. Okay. Um, let me just uh, quickly say what I'm going to do. I'll need somebody who can time at me 60 seconds when I say start. Thank you. And then I'll need 20 seconds when I say 20 seconds. And um, I'm going to do the sociability test, as, um, not because we're temperament testing. It, it allows us uh, an, a minute and 50 seconds to observe the dog and step back, and it gives us an objective unit of something to do the same with all the dogs. And I want you to tell me what you see. A couple of things quickly. Um, I'm going to talk defensive handling uh, a little bit later, but when it, let me tell you the first things. Whenever I'm going to handle a dog, here's a few things I do. I make sure my shoelaces are tied and... Um, and set not to be untied. And if I, so I'll double knot them if I need to, or I'll do my special knot, because these are my pretty shoelaces that came with these shoes, but they don't stay tied, so they're useless. Um, I put my keys that were jangling in my pocket. I took my dangling reading glasses off. My hair is just perfect. It's not dangling, it's not in my face. I would tie it back if it were long. And um, if I have a necklace, I'll put it um, under my shirt. And the reason is, if I'm going to be handling dogs, I don't want to be distracted for one second when I've got the dog. It'll be distracting enough. And uh, I'm going to try to make sense to you and say everything, but the dog will direct my attention. And then I'll talk to you about uh, leash handling as it's happening. Um, the other thing I did is I took all food out of my pocket. I know he can still smell it, I'm sure, but I don't have food on me for a couple, yeah, is it off? No, I just, how much do you just want? The just the dog, the not me. <laughs> I, had, I showed one bit of footage uh, once from the past of me and a dog, and I always think, oh, well, people are watching the dog, right? So a woman from the audience, completely seriously, she raises her hand and she goes, is that your hair or are you wearing a helmet? strong on leash and I have to get him past the equipment here. The only way to walk with a dog who's pulling and dragging you is to either keep him at your side, sort of cutting off his airway, or to let him pull ahead of you and walk right behind him. I'm not going to stop him from pulling because what I need to do, start the 60 seconds, is an assessment. So start describing behaviors. Waggy body. It'd be two, almost two seconds, but not. So let's give him an arousal number. I'd put him at 50. 60. 50. This is where it's going. It's subjective. His tail is um, mostly high. He's got a very steep croup, a little part from his pelvis uh, down. He just touched me with his teeth. He just touched the leash with his teeth. I know you're wanting to know what that means. I have no idea. All right, so that's 60 seconds. I'll do the three strokes, the first stroke. Did you hear his arousal go up in his breathing? There it didn't go up. And I'm going to sit in a chair and we're going to observe for five seconds. Five, four, three, 
two, one, and now 20 seconds, please. Yes, good one, thank you. He's my good boy, come here. Are you a good boy? Who is a good boy? Come here. Okay, good boy. Good boy. Come here. Who's a good boy? Come here. That's a good boy. Are you a good boy? Are you a good boy? Come here. Who's a good boy? Come here. Good boy. Good boy. Come here. Okay. Excuse me, we're going for a ride. All right, so well, how many sociability points? Yeah, uh, uh, zero to one. And is that because I don't like Great Dane mixes? No. Did we all... He didn't show, have any, right? Would anyone like to make the first excuse? And I, I mean that sincerely. I'm not like... I say it flippantly. But does anyone have an excuse? Let's just say it out loud. Yeah. Yes, she kept say, saying she was looking at certain things and saying maybe that was by accident. And you know, we don't know. But again, this is a ob more objective basis for what we're doing. What I'll tell you is his threshold uh, for using his mouth, he's right at threshold. Anytime I say hi, his mouth, if I showed you in slow motion, his mouth is open and his head is whipping and his teeth are on me. He's not bearing down, right there. He's not, uh, it's not painful, it's certainly not scary, but um, his threshold, he's right under his threshold. However, the level of his aggression right now is tiny. In other words, he's not serious or freezing, but um, he is right there. I'm trying to, now you won't do it because I said it. I should say it in Spanish. Um, um, so his tail stays high. He had a low sociability score. And what I'll tell you is it would indica will indicate, and nothing else, not doing any other assessment, he'll have a longer than average length of stay. And you'll think, oh, it's because he's a big black dog. No, he's a big black dog and no sociability. And, um, and so people, the public doesn't select non-sociable dogs. They are looking to make a connection. And that's not me not liking him or anything. It's just the truth. And um, it's just the truth. And he's, here I'm sort of rubbing his ears. Did you see him bite and then lick? And so he's got low thresholds. So I would predict in him a high risk of return, a longer than average length of stay, and um, more uh, higher than average problem behaviors. And none of that is because I don't like him. Um, I don't find him scary, but he is a lot of dog, and he's way too much for the average person who would come in. And he's very strong, which means he has a very higher incident of um, pulling people off their feet or, um, you know, just a difficult nature. And these are just, you know, that's, that's just what he's telling me as a dog. And the thing about um, every, every dog, even the one you buy from the best breeder, will have problem behaviors. Like every human, we have some behavior problem. And if you think you're, you have a dog that doesn't, I'll tell you he's older than five and all you've done is compromise and forgotten. Um, and it doesn't have to be a bad problem, but there are, in, in every dog, there's things you want to change or you already have changed. Um, so every dog comes with problems. The problem with dogs who have low sociability is when you put them in a home, they're not giving a lot back to the owner, at least initially. And so their uh, commitment to working on the problem, it's not that they're uncommitted, but they're going to have a much harder time. If he were social and, and soft and giving a lot back, they would are more likely to stick with him and deal. What's this? It's a shoulder stance. Um, so uh, that's his behavior. What do you? Come on down, D. And uh, yeah, so just walk directly at me, and you can look at me. How are you? Good. That's great. And uh, so I'm not stopping him, right? I'm still sort of seeing what he's going to do. So he pulls me off. Sorry, there we go. Stay right there. He pulls me off, off, off my chair to go say hello. Um, and I know at first you're thinking, oh, but he's much more sociable with her. But no, it was, uh, it was just as brief. It was forceful. It was um, con confident and aroused. Um, again, he's a, he's a lot of dog, and he's very independent in his thinking and his actions. Oh, don't, but not suicidal. Don't electrocute yourself. 
All right, that was great. Now come still, 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 D, come back. Um, good. Now uh, walk over to the wall, and now walk toward me. Do you understand where he's positioning himself just subtly? Now walk around and come this way. I'm not um, holding him. Good, just walk around him. <laughs> so it's very subtle um, behaviors, but in other words, he's controlling all the access to resources. Come closer to me. Come all the way right in here. Quick, quick, come to me. Good, stay there. Great, thank you. You can go sit. That was wonderful. Um, but again, so allowing him just to be who he is, if he were my dog, I wouldn't allow any of that. But here he is in a shoulder stance. Um, might he have issues with strangers? Yes. When he roots in, gets comfortable, he could. He's indicating some sort of resource guarding issues, controlling access to things. He's certainly a decision maker, isn't he? For himself. Yeah. So it's a lot of dog. But in a goofy, friendly way. However, he's not just goofy, funny, and friendly. There's a lot to him. Um, yeah, and a good boy. You have little tiny feet for a big body. It's like ballet shoes. Ah, do you see different behaviors if the dog's exercised for an hour? First of all, anytime you have a question like that, as if you can, answer some of your questions by doing it. Like, it would be interesting to then exercise them. A lot of people say, well, you know, should we give him, allow him to run off steam or burn off energy before coming in? And all I'll tell you is that it will increase his arousal and lower his chances to show sociability. And um, if you could hook him up to a, um, a bike and do, you know, like a sled dog activity or have him pulling for, I don't know, um, five miles, seven miles, he would be tired, but then he would come in and collapse, and then he still wouldn't be social. He has a high arousal and a high energy level, which will be um, unchanged by physical exercise. He, he has its mental arousal. And uh, at the end of today, if you remind me, I'll try and show you an exercise that I would do for a dog like this. Don't get me wrong, he needs physical exercise. Wow, does he need physical exercise. And that's going to be hard to give him because he's a big boy. Because he needs physical exercise means absolutely all out galloping, loping, um, and a lot longer. A 45 minute walk will only send his arousal and his frustration through the roof. So um, those are some of his needs. All right, big guy. So let's um, put him away and meet uh, another dog. Thank you. And um, oh, great, actually, we'll just change. You can take this leash. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, this and um, just say heel, and he'll just pop. <laughs> um, and again, a dog who's dragging that hard, uh, it's not just that he's unleash trained. Part of it is he's, um, he doesn't care what you're doing. He's ready to explore all the environments. He's a complete initiator, right? If, he, if you drop the leash, he wouldn't look back. He doesn't check in with you. All of that would have to be taught. Um, and. Uh, and he's dragging, but again, the only way to handle a dog, to walk that way, and um, there's handling, and then there's training. And I'm wearing my handler hat, not my training hat. But the importance of, of handling is observing and getting a good picture of who that dog is. He is a, a space taker. He uh, jumps up during the, when I sat for the sociability, there was one point where I had to move my head back because he swung his head so fast. And so, if you give the advice to somebody, a client, when he jumps up, turn your back, the behavior will get worse. That's what he wants. So while that's an effective method on many dogs, on this temperament, it'll backfire. Any energy you give that dog, even just emotional energy, will reward him. He feeds off of arousal. And um, he will consider nothing negative. In other words, Honestly, you could, you know, hit him and he would be, you know, probably gleeful. If you hit him on his butt, he'd be like, oh, fantastic. Um, and you yell, no, he couldn't care less. He has no mental sensitivity. He has no natural sort of deference to humans. All of that would have to be taught. And um, uh, I don't, he, the question is, with more training, could he, 
could he be more, he doesn't need any socialization. It would actually be better if you pulled the rug out from under him. He's like, let me go new places and not, I don't even care. So he's fine with novelty. Um, what I wouldn't try to increase is his sociability, and we don't know if that increases. What will increase, once you start training with him, like if you do a shaping thing and he's like, oh, this is fantastic, you're allowing me to use my brain, because he's smarter than average, okay, he's a very bright dog, um, and he has not good frustration tolerance, all those things. You start training him, and he looks at you and says, this is amazing, and this is really fun, and you're not fighting me on this and you start developing a bond, you do more things with him, you show him a good time, he will start looking at you more. You start rewarding it. Is he getting to be a soft, sociable dog? No. He won't be. Um, but he will be much more engaged with you, um, with, with training. Ah, the, um, if I opened up my atlas of dog breeds, I would fake this dog as a, as a German hunt terrier or whatever. It's a terrier mix, I'm sure, but you know, did you ever look through the atlas? You can basically take any mixed breed, Sec uh, 60 seconds please, you can take any mixed breed and make it into a really rare purebred. It's amazing. <laughs> right? I mean, I've had people find a beach dog on the streets of, you know, Greece, and they're like, amazing, this is a, a Jägermeister, and it's, you know, there's five of them in Poland. And so let's give her an arousal number. If she weren't sniffing, it would be uh, sociability. I would say arousal 20. Okay, f fairly low. She's done a couple of lunge aways. I think that was the second or third. That was the fourth. And a little bit. It wasn't after contact, but yeah, good observation. The head shake, they said. Some contact with leash, right. Mm -hmm. um, do you notice what's happening? Uh, Tate, let me pet her and then explain about the leash. That was one. That was the first time she made eye contact, her pupils were dilated and it was di direct. Two, and she's a space taker, do you see that? I bend down, she moves her head here. That was a freeze and did you see her tail rise? So she's heading up toward threshold just for petting. So she, this, is, this is, would be counted as sociability. It's five seconds, and then 20 seconds. Come here. Good girl. Oh, good girl. Oh, good girl. I know. That's like, well, is she freezing? She's staying here. Is she freezing because she likes it, or is she freezing? She liked it, and she's freezing. <laughs> good girl. Are you a good girl? Who's my good girl? She's a space taker, staring me right in the eye, like right there. Yeah. She is really cute, and she's in conflict. She, um, she wanted the social contact, and then it put her at threshold. Now, I was going to say, what's happening to the leash? Do you see it's turned into a barbershop light? Um, and she's uh, spinning. And so a couple things about spinning. I think dogs who spin tend to have conflict behaviors and are often fearful. Um, fearful and or sociable, but what you, it's an approach retreat, approach retreat, those are the dogs most likely to spin. That's my opinion. Um, if you want to undo it, I reach down here and then I'll let go. That keeps me in control. So she's fighting me, dead on frontal, she froze, hard staring me because she wants me to be off the leash. Um, so she's, she's living right under threshold here. She's not quite sure what she wants. Um, so if I had to make an excuse, I would say, is this pre-defecatory agita, meaning does she have to poop and that's why she's acting like this? If she had to poop, it wouldn't lower her aggression thresholds. That's just who she is. But the sort of whining frustration and that, is it like, does she have a BM in there? That's an excuse, mind you, right? But a perfectly testable one, you could take her out to see if she has to poop and if she does, you can bring her back in and see if she's any different. You see the spinning? A couple things I look at a dog with her is I worry that she'll start spinning in her kennel. Yes, and she often has high base, low tip, which is also conflict. Can I show you real quick she does something? Yes. 
So here's somebody she knows. Isn't that interesting? Ears back. Okay. She'll grab onto my leg and she'll hump. Oh, oh, okay. So she said she'll grab onto her leg and hump. Pet, pet her a little bit, stimulate her. Oh, see how she held space there? Didn't you want to say, oh, move your head away? Didn't you feel like a little worried there? Do you see her stiffen? She wants social contact and she'll bite you for social contact. Um, and uh, and uh, again, stay here. She, what's really interesting is a dog who is sociable, when you bend down, she would move her head out of the plane. That's natural, that's deference, that's friendly. She holds space. And that is a dog that's close to um, biting. Um, and it's not good because she would you know, and likely bite your face. But you see how she holds it when you move in? Your friendly dogs will turn away or close their eyes or some you know, twist off of it. And again, humping so often is conflict, which is so interesting that, tell me she'll, your name again. Dee Dee. She'll grab onto my leg and she'll kind of like, when you were talking earlier about yeah. it, like the Clasp. Clasp. Yeah. And then when she first did it, I thought, oh, she's just trying to get attention. And then she started humping me. Yeah. And a little all aligned, right? Everything in a row. She doesn't know what she wants. How long has she been here? Um, she was actually, I uh, came from another shelter. She's only been here three days. Okay. And how long was she at the other shelter? A while. A while. Yeah. That may be where she developed spinning, because I'm telling you, she's likely to spin in her kennel. And what is a while? Do you know? Um, I believe a month and a half. Okay. And so she's a tiny little adorable terrier mix at a shelter for a month and a half. In all likelihood, it's her behavior that's preventing people from uh, selecting her. Do you know how she had, does she have any returns on her? No, um, but the, the shelter that she came from kind of has, uh, how do you explain what Canyon County does for their a application procedure? They make you, they make you go through uh, like a, like an interview and application okay. and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's hard to adopt. It's harder there to adopt. Okay. Oh, she's going to mount. And you see how that's the um, urine marking sniffing? Um, and again, all part of it, but she was thinking of mounting. Move around a little bit, pet her again. Good, and now stand up. Good, back up one step. Move forward. Did she keep doing that set nervous too, the yawning? The yeah. And again, really direct eye contact. She's an interesting little dog. Does she have trained, have you trained her? No, I haven't done anything. And the type of eye contact, and I have video footage, the trained in eye contact or eye contact, you know, that's been rewarded or for treats isn't, doesn't look like that. Um, eye contact um, for treats, and I, it's hard to describe it, is um, they'll look at you um, and they'll blink, they'll often blink one eye. Um, what she's doing is this. It's, she's hard staring and her pupils are really dilated and sometimes they'll dilate for food as well. Um, and this is Gina, when I walked her out here, a little kid came around the corner from the Get Acquainted Hallway running and she grabbed a lunch at him. Oh, so that's, um, and that's problematic too because you can place her in a home without kids, but if she's actively lunging at kids in the environment, then you have to find the aliens that land from the planet where everyone's barren and sterile and there are no children ever. Um, so it's very difficult. She's also, that says she's going to have problems with strangers. She noticed somebody who came in, she alerted, her tail went down, it's like mostly fear. Um, and again, when I bring my head down, you see how she blocks with her, her nose? It does a little um, nose touch. You're a lot of dog. Mm. There's a clasp, okay. All right, cool, very interesting dog. Um, and if I were going to handle it, let's say I had to put her up on a table and do a heartworm test, um, a couple things I would do. And um, I, I, I maintained the stare with her, not as part of defensive handling, but I was curious what she would do if I didn't look away first. Um, and she did. But a couple things. If I'm going to like, lift her up or put her on a table, I don't want to advertise to her that I need to do that or that I'm going to do something. And um, one of the reasons is even in changing my leash, she will look up, she's ready. She's at threshold and she's, she's ready for action. Um, so I don't want to advertise necessarily that I want to do anything. So I have a couple of 
options for doing it. I can, if I just had to get her onto an exam table and, I don't know, whatever, or if I had to put her in an upper cage, let's say, or up into a, a truck, I would probably just bring my hand lower, bring her head forward, and scoop her up in a way that if she tried to bite, I would be able to hold her head off. She'd be biting here. And so I'd sort of cut off her airway and I'd hold her there to pick her up. Um, and if I had to put her on a table and we were going to do a heartworm test or a vaccine or a Bordetella, I, I had to put her up somewhere, uh, like lift her and then do something, I would leash strap muzzle her while she's down here. And um, if her tail were higher, she's um, doing all sorts of swiping, but she, her, ta her tail's in between. Um, and I would, do, I would just do a slow leash wrap muzzle and raise it over her head. And um, if, if I, I would do it on my leather leash. I always recommend that you have a leash on a dog that you're comfortable with. And this is a great leash otherwise, or I wouldn't be using it. But if I'm going to do a leash wrap muzzle or do any technique, I want my leash. I want to be in my comfort zone. Um, but anyway, so if I had to lift her up, I would do it really carefully. Do you see how I just held her and I would just lift her up, boom, and do it? Is that comfortable? Is that a gentle, beautiful, positive way to get a dog to enjoy being lifted up? No. Um, she says the leash. Um, but it is a, uh, it's an efficient way. Look how that um, raised the ante of um, her aggression threshold, right? I said it was going to lift her up. Now she's dead on frontal. This is the position of power. That was um, a bite to the hand. She didn't bite it, but did you see her mouth went open? So she's completely, um, she's having a meltdown. And it was precipitated by me actually violating and going in there and um, lifting her up. And again, I'm a handler. If this were your dog and it was in a home and you're hiring me for training, I would never say, well, the way you gotta lift her up is to stick a leash on her and choke her this way and pop your, under, your arm here. I wouldn't do it that way. Um, if you, this dog were in a home, um, hang on, I'm diverting. She's chewing the leash, and so I want to t show you what I would do for leash chewing, because if she gets this leash in her molars and chews through it, I'm doomed. So when she chews on the leash, I will put subtle pressure toward me, all right? I pull her toward me until she pulls away, and when she lets go, I'll give her attention. It's, I guess, negative reinforcement if you were going to know about four quadrants, which I don't, video. Um, but um, um, what I'm doing is I won't address her at all when she does it. I won't give her any attention when she's chewing on the leash, but I need her to stop. If I were to reach down and pull her muzzle off of it, can you see how that would escalate everything? Not only um, she wants, this is a, half of this is attention-seeking behaviors, and the other half is just aggression and frustration. But um, I pull, when she gives, I give her release. And normally I would do it just by feel, I wouldn't even look at her. And um, I, wanted, I wanna do that because I, I need her to stop. I don't, I don't wanna teach her uh, to stop, I just need her not to chew through this leash while we're together. And I, I put just enough pressure that she pulls back, not enough so that she's choking or gagging. How do you get to that point? You absolutely have to handle dogs and give a feel for it. And one of the things we've lost in the positive reinforcement and reward-based training revolution is we've lost the ability to feel a dog on the end of a leash. And we've also lost the ability um, how to communicate with just the leash. And, uh, that, and that's one of the things she needs. And I know you're thinking, look, you should put her away. She's so frustrated. She's hitting threshold. And what I'll say is, how low is her threshold if this is um, doing this? I mean, this is just something to see. Um, she has, this dog has a lot of trouble just coping in a human world at the, at the just as the slightest thing. Um, so, and now I'm not being a trainer, but I'm curious if she's lived with somebody and if she's had any training. So this is not me as a trainer. Are we aware? Let's nod. Sit, sit, sit. Okay, good dog. No, she, I don't think she's had. I'll let, how about this? Sit, sit, sit pretty. Sit. So these are just ways I see if anyone has trained her with their own little methods. Sit down. Sit down. <laughs> see it. No. 
And ag again, this is a dog who's saying, if you discipline her at all, she'll come right back and bite you. Right? All I did was raise my voice and slap my leg, and she turned around and hard stared. Um, She's so young. Is she young too? Like seven, eight oh, seven or eight months. Um, all right. Awesome. I'll, let's get another. She's uh, very interesting. And um, yeah, it's a lot of dog. And I asked for um, problematic dogs for defensive handling. Um, so time 60 seconds. And tell me about him immediately. Give me some observations. Tail right up over his back. Um, very muscular. Again, uh, frontal and aligned uh, in a lot of his interactions. <laughs> yeah, he's not jumping. Did a little spinning. His eyes are red. Very, very aroused. And, um, um, was this the sniffing? Uh, I call it sniffing more than two seconds. He's been doing it almost consistently. I see a high correlation between that type of sniffing, thank you, and dog-to-dog -dog aggression. Uh, frontal, he took a frontal realignment. So five, four, three, two, one, zero, and now 20 seconds. Come here, buddy. Who's a good boy, huh? Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? Come here. That a boy. Good boy. Good boy. Are you a good boy? Are you a good boy? Good boy. And uh, frontal and aligned, and I thought, oh, sociability, and he rubbed and he left and drooled. Um, So, tell me about his sociability. So she said, he seems more interested in me as an object than as, I didn't hear, but sort of, and um, yes, that's an interpretation, one that I would agree with, but if, if I said, well, he's more interested in me as an object than as, you know, as a friend, that would open it, things up for you to think under your breath, well, of course, you know, we know your reputation. What dog would like you? You never pass a pit bull. Or whatever people say behind your back when you do evaluations. Um, whereas if you say his sociability score was zero, and what concerns me is how much of that time he spent sniffing my pants or the floor. And I'm concerned also because he's a large muscular bull breed, I'm concerned about dog-to-dog -dog issues. Um, and that's just, that's a, a fact. Um, and uh, oh, did you see it? Grasshoppers, the classic anal swipe. And then he smells and sniffs his work. Fine. He says, oh, a double. Um, and again, uh, there's no social gestures, even less um, than the, the Dane mix. He is, um, he's touching me here. This is a shoulder stance. Um, dogs that lean, what is that indicative of? Um, if it's your own dog in your home and he's leaning, I think that's probably a combination of love and resource guarding and affection or whatever. Um, and again, there's the conflict tale. Um, his leaning is part of guarding uh, me, but he's had no sociability. This, uh, his, um, he's a classic, this is shoulder stance. This temperament and type is what we see in shelters all over the place, most often in high crime urban areas. And I actually think there's a mutation somewhere in, along the line. And what's missing in him is absolutely no sociability and no social gestures, no response to people whatsoever, and no fear, no hazard avoidance, which is a biological like, where does that come from? But the dangerous things about um, dogs like this is 
And again, I touch him. Do you see how high his tail came and how aroused he got? Um, the most dangerous kind of predator out there are ones that are habituated to humans, who will be in close proximity to humans. If you're a wild bear and you hardly see humans and you don't eat their garbage, if we encountered each other, me and the bear, in the wild, it would run. There's a huge flight distance. When you have a bear that's habituated to humans and garbage, um, those are the ones most likely to attack. And I'm, um, I'm sure this is, um, um, this is what gets me into trouble on the internet, but the honest truth about this dog is these are, are dangerous dogs for a couple of reasons. Um, and again, all I've done is sociability testing. I've not done anything else. But the sheer strength of how he walks into the room, this level of confidence and ownership and presence around everything, um, and the absolute lack, he's not even putting his ears back. There's no social gestures. The domestic dog qualities are not in him. And when you have that, I think you have a really dangerous animal. And uh, if he gets to a threshold, I don't think there's anything gonna in, that's going to inhibit him naturally, in, in, innately. And I know that um, I'm saying that because it's... Uh, I, I say that from experience in, in this type of dog, and I also know that, um, and again, I go to touch him, and you see I just right away uh, takes, takes space, confidence, um, but these are uh, it's a troublesome profile. If this were a Maltese or a Beagle doing this, the likelihood that the dog could kill somebody in his lifetime is really low. When we make dogs, and this is a small pit from where I come from, if we make dogs this muscular, and she's a bitch, that's amazing. She's a really doggy bitch, um, meaning she's got all male qualities. And um, there's theories, if not, I think might be proven at this point, but that um, these dogs have testosterone. I mean, she's a testosterone machine. She looks all the secondary sexual characteristics of testosterone. Um, and um, the theory is that in utero, if she's sandwiched in the litter between male, a lot of male puppies, that there'll be this transference of testosterone. And especially after spaying, when you take any of the estrogens out, you get basically um, a testosterone dog. I mean, her muscling, this dog looks like a male. There's a higher incidence, um, I don't know if this is proven or whether it's just anecdotal, a higher incidence of dog-to-dog -dog aggression from females that are, are androgenized. Um, which again concerns me because again she's been hyper sniffing and hyper focusing. This is to me the um, what we're seeing in shelters more and more because this dog is unaffected by our spay neuter message. In other words, we're spaying and neutering all the nicest and most successful pet dogs and our spay neuter message, our motivating reasons to get it done are irrelevant to people with guarding and fighting dogs. And so what we're seeing on the increase in shelters, shelters see the unwanted portion of, of dogs. What we're seeing in shelters is a higher incidence of, um, higher uh, volume of guarding and fighting dogs and mixes. And we're seeing um, much fewer behaviorally highly adoptable dogs, and, and which is what you would expect if you're spaying and neutering to reduce numbers. The first population that you'll get rid of in the shelter system are the nice dogs, because they're not unwanted anymore. We used to get unwanted nice dogs because there were not enough homes. Well, now that's not as much the problem. We have a lot of homes. We just don't have a lot of you know, really sweet, easy family pet dogs. That's the first population that the shelter will stop seeing. And in particular, all we have in this country and all we've had since the 70s to reduce the um, euthanasia of dogs and cats in shelters is a spay-neuter campaign. That's what we said in this country we need to, so we don't euthanize 23 million dogs and cats a year. And, because that's what we were euthanizing in the 70s. The current estimates to what we're um, euthanizing is anywhere from two to five million annually. And that's not cats and dogs divided. The vast majority of that is likely to be cats, which are completely out of control in terms of overpopulation. And, um, um, and so what we're seeing in shelters are dogs that you could tell somebody to spay and neuter, you could give them all the reasons we tell people, but if you're in a high crime urban area, none of those reasons will make you want to run home and neuter or spay your animal. And it's not because you're stupid and it's not because you're bad or irresponsible. It's because our message and the reasons for doing it absolutely don't apply to people. Like, 
If I walk down the street with her in a very high crime urban area, um, she would be meeting other dogs that are very big and dog aggressive, and they probably wouldn't attempt to mess with her. And if they tried, she'd go out there and hit the end of her leash and go after them and chase them away. If I walked through a high crime urban area with my groveling, peeing cattle dog, she'd be killed the, in an instant. She'd be selected and, and aggressed after she'd be a target. If I was in a high crime urban neighborhood and I had to rock, walk past a drug bust, mm, this dog would protect me more than a soft, um, sweet family pet dog would um, from a, a group of guys although she's more likely to be stolen from me, to be used for guarding. Um, but anyway, so this, we're seeing more and more dogs like her. Her mother and her father were not successful pet family pets. They were in all likelihood guarding, fighting, or macho um, dogs. And again, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Oh God, you're confident. Um, and she was not raised to be a successful family pet in a home and you know, raised around kids necessarily. Um, and by putting her in a shelter, there's very little we can do to make this dog into a family pet to go live with the average person. And I know we've not looked at very much. I'm only, I'm only surmising things um, from what I know, but this has all been guarding of me as property. There's been not one iota of um, sociability or social contact with you guys. Um, and that's just uh, a bunch of observations. And again, oh, you have a dog. Uh, Stino, just uh, walk to me, just all the way up to me, and I'll talk to you. You can ignore her. How are you? How are you? How are you doing? Good, and come here. And so we're just going to see the behaviors. And uh, um, much less uh, cutting and guarding and gaining access to resources. Although, um, no looking at her either. Like, I, I thought there'd be some check she in. Over there. She did. Well, that's because I'm her servant. Yeah, it's a servant. Um, okay, thank you for doing that. I'll keep her another little bit. Um, so. Well, let's narrow down our choices. Let's see, there's two men to choose from. One is busy. Man from Boston, come on down. And um, you're just going to walk uh, directly toward me. You can look at me and say hi. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. And uh, good, it's really nice to know you. And he lowered his tail, she lowered her tail for this guy. A lot of sniffing. Again, red flag, thanks. What's your name? John. John. The question is, is she, um, is she more red flag? Oh, now she's fearful. Do you see how that changed? And she hard stared me? That's all wrong. Um, um, oh, the question was, is she more red flag than the Black Dane mix, I'm assuming you're asking, because he cut in between. No, he's more of a resource guarder. Um, he, giving more indications of resource guarding. Um, he, so frontal aligned, direct eye contact. Yeah, and um, uh, I, I, I don't like, as she says subjectively, but how she went from sort of high arousal, utter confidence to near panic, near like now, like this, do you see it? She's ready now, prepared for the worst. Yeah, a really unstable, um, that's very unstable and unusual. Down, good girl, good boy. Um, um, it's a really interesting dog. Anyway, the dilemma in shelters in this country, if you're open admission and you don't just refuse dogs like this and you get them, um, our jobs are, we're all, in all our shelters right now, uh, we're under huge pressure from a board of directors and other rescue groups and whatever to become a no-kill nation and to reduce our euthanasia numbers and raise our adoption numbers. 
And the problem is, we've, in this country, we've depended on our spay-neuter campaign. And it's been really successful. We've reduced numbers of dogs incredibly. We're still euthanizing, um, but our numbers are way down. It's, it's considered hugely successful. The, the problem is, um, if we continue to do what we're doing, which is to be very successful, our euthanasia numbers should be going up and our adoption numbers down because the dogs we're getting are less and less adoptable. We've taken care of the cream of the crop and now what we're seeing are the most difficult. Grasshoppers, are we seeing? Okay. Um, and now, but we're all under pressure to, to place dogs more. And it's all about numbers. And the problem with numbers is every single number or statistic is an actual individual dog with his individual set of good behaviors and bad behaviors and problem behaviors and the ability to fit in safely in the community. Um, and, and that's a huge problem. So um, this is a really... Somebody snapped? Okay. Yes. I'll repeat it. So one the comment from one person to another was that this is the only dog that chilled. Like she settled down. Like she took her arousal level and went, and went down. Um, um, again, that would be great. I would say, hey, that's a really nice quality. She's able to settle. She has patience. In the, but she's not given, um, there's just not one social gesture. There's not one actual connection, not even with Stina. When Stina came over, a little bit with John when the man came over. Um, but then, of course, that then triggered all sorts of fear stuff afterwards. She's, she's hypervigilant. Do you see how she notices every stranger? And um, the woman who just talk to me, who, who'd snapped your finger, stand, just stand up right where you are in your seat and stand up. And again, this is all hypervigilance. She notices, and you can sit now, thank you. She notices when people move, when they come in and out. And in the absence of sociability, when you notice all of that, you're likely to become stranger aggressive. Otherwise, you would simply not be looking at strangers. That wouldn't be your issue. You wouldn't even notice them. Um, So very interesting dog, very um, archetypal of what we're seeing. It's, it's a huge problem. Um, and I don't, I don't know what her dog-to-dog -dog stuff is, but she red flags for me. And, uh, and if you don't see it, that's fine. Um, I've, I've been working in the shelter world since 81, and it, it took me... Um, uh, probably to at least the mid-90s before I actually thought I could see things that I, I knew. And then um, every year I see more and more things. But I know that I didn't see a lot for a long time. Um, is there a place for a dog? Is there a place for a dog? Well, give me the description of um, a home. Again, I don't know... Um, I hate to traumatize the Chihuahua, although, however, sometimes Chihuahuas traumatize pit bulls. Um, oh, I was going to ask uh, if, what she's like with other dogs. She has severe redirected aggression toward the handler. Has she um, nailed anyone? No, I have to hold her like this. Okay. She will actually, either she can't jump on me, she will do the wall thing. Okay, so if she can't, um, she gets held out here, um, and when she can't, uh, get to Stina, she'll redirect on a wall and leap around the wall. So, okay, so let's say there are serious dog issues, all right, lunging at, at strange dogs. Um, dog, dog aggression, serious dog aggression, let's say that. And just, I mean, we didn't do any as, full assessment, but just what we're seeing here. Um, what, uh, give me the description of a home, a, a home that could make it work. And I mean it seriously, I'm not being flippant. Like, let's describe a home where she could be successful. Okay, she'd have to be the only dog? No kids. No kids. Well, however, what about dogs in the neighborhood? Should she, should she be on an island in, in the Baffin Islands?
Um, so, uh, say it again. Well contained during the day. And how um, how 100% successful is containment in general? Um, you know, not to say that containment never works, but in general, things that require a gate that gets shut um, or things that can't be climbed over or under, um, in general, there are incidences where they fail in the lifetime of the dog. And in one incident, going after other dogs or whatever, you could, you could have a problem. But anyway, so somebody with a, let's say, an eight-foot high cement wall in their backyard, they have no other dogs and they don't want to get any dogs and they shouldn't have friends who visit with dogs. I mean, maybe she'd get along with a male pit, you know, um, whatever, or maybe not. What else? What should the person, should they work all day? Okay, a firm, consistent, well-educated dog owner. Uh, no, I, um, and so um, let's say, well, there aren't that many of them around, and a well-educated, meaning the college degree or educated in dogs? Dog knowledge. And if you knew about dogs, and I said, this dog is um, a potential for a serious problem, aggression towards uh, humans, has no sociability, to train her, you'd be training her as like, a lab rat, meaning there's no, um, she's not going to do anything to please you or to avoid doing something to displease you. She's like just a reinforcement machine. Um, she's really strong and she's easily aroused. We know she'll redirect, so if you get her from your eight-foot solid chain uh, cement wall into the car to get her to the veterinarian um, and she sees another dog, she could redirect on a, a person. So he's saying all these things, and she's got um, what we consider, um, I mean, I haven't looked at her, but let's say serious dog issues. If I was well-educated about dogs, I would say, thank you um, very much. Would I, if I have not yet bonded to her, this will not be the dog I select. If you've ever lived with a, an aggressive dog, either to people or humans, I mean, to uh, humans or dogs, it's 100% management for life and it's very limiting. It's hard to find a dog sitter. You can't have a dog sitter. The dog has to go to a kennel. Leaving them is hard. Um, you can't have a normal life. You can't imagine yourself like hiking or biking or doing things to give her quality of life. So it's a very restricted, um, it's a very restricted lifestyle. And, um, and so all I'm saying is that if she were in somebody's home and they said, look, we have no kids, and I said, all right, well, this is your dog. There's a lot of dangerous qualities to her, but if, you know, if you're willing, you're not afraid, you're not going to pair bond and mate with anyone in the lifetime of the dog. Um, do you have the money to put up this type of, of fence? You'll need a double fence, double gate system so that when one person opens a gate, um, she would get caught in the second gate. Um, if you take her out in public, I would muzzle her. You'll have to start training her this way, and we would meet for training sessions probably the rest of your dog's life. And if the person said, I'm, I've got the money and the time and the willingness, I would say, let's see what we can do. Let is, let's just start training, and I'm going to give you everything that I would do with this dog. And that person would say, I'll do anything for Lulu, or whatever her name is. Um, but the problem is, we made no effort to keep her in her original home. We set up a shelter, which waits for people to break the bond and to get rid of their dogs. And, um, and so now she's here without a home. And now we have to try and find her a home or figure out what to do with her. And I'm saying, do you see how difficult it is? If you're really honest with somebody, what, what are you saying? I'm, at, I'm saying that I'm worried she could kill another dog and I'm quite frankly worried um, if she's stimulated by things in the distance and she's got no human um, contact, what would she be like outside of a school uh, playground? What if a child runs by? Um, and so I'm saying I'm worried about really serious aggression, and I'm saying her, the qualities that she has are not of a regular pet dog. And so I would either place her by duping somebody, by, not, by saying it all with euphemisms, like, oh, well, she's going to need a lot of, of work, and um, she's going to need a lot of time, and she's very strong, and you'll need to do a lot of training, and they'll be like, oh, I'm willing to do all of that. 
what, what I'm really saying is I'm really concerned about her fitting into society and making it at all, and I'm worried about serious levels of aggression. And if you say that, um, you better not say it in front of your liability insurance carrier, because if they know you placed a dog like this into the community and she had an event, uh, I think you'd be dropped, and I think you'd be open for lawsuits, um, which is the other issue. And I'm not telling you what to do with her. All I'm saying is you have to consider all of these things. In many ways, the less you know about dogs, the better you're able to place a dog like this. You place a dog like this by not testing her, not knowing her, and saying she's just a big, strong, untrained, lovely um, pit bull, and anyone who likes pits would, you know, they know that the breed is strong, and the breed can be bad with dogs, and she just needs a firm hand, and, and whatever. And, and you could find her home and hope the person who takes her is head over heels so in love with her and has enough money um, that you could do it. Um, oh, honey, please, you're hard staring me. Um, and the problem is, she won't get adopted quickly because most of the people coming in are average people. Most of the people coming into a shelter have children already in the home, on the way, or they live in an environment where there are children in school playgrounds and, and things like that. And the other fact of the matter is, if she's going to have a longer than average length of stay, because you're limiting her placement options, which you should if you're going to place her, she should be very limited as to who should take her, then she's going to be in the shelter a long period of time. And I'll tell you right now, pits don't kennel that well. They deteriorate really quickly. And, uh, and if she's already going after other dogs, I imagine she'll go after dogs if you put her in a kennel and walk one past her. And if she's doing that, that behavior is contagious to the dogs next to her and across from her, and they will start developing the habit of lunging at other dogs. So, and if I were a rescue group, there are a lot of nice pits that get euthanized in shelters because it's just a pit bull. And if I had to rescue one, I, I don't mean to sound callous, but this isn't the one I would rescue. I would rescue a really nice pit bull that'll go out there and show people that pits are great dogs and they make great community citizens. And that I'm sure sounds really harsh, and if so, change your life, become a rescuer and um, set up a, an area where you can take these dogs and completely train them and, and place them so they don't have to get euthanized. If, I'm not saying that's what is going to be done, but um, and for God's sakes, why don't we intervene earlier? Why did this dog have to be bred? I'm sorry, I don't mean it personally. Um, no, but it's like, why are we trying to place her? Why didn't we spay and neuter her parents? Um, you know, we, we did nothing to uh, try and change that, and we're doing nothing to try and change that. All we're doing is waiting till these dogs end up in our care and then fighting over who decides their fate. All right, let's uh, take a couple more dogs.